cool. Um, are there any questions? Please pop them into the chat window if you have any questions on that so far. Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, oh, the artwork in this, by the way, was put together by a traditional artist um, and is actually um, a property of TAFE Queensland. Um, the, the artwork in this was put together specifically for a reconciliation action plan. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many and diverse lands on which we meet today, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and give thanks for their enduring stewardship of the environments in which we live and work. Webinar two, up play. We have a number of presenters. Uh, Steph Piper is going to be the first cab off the rank. She's from the University of Southern Queensland. Um, after that, we're going to have Daniel Walker and Sue Hutley who are going to be gamifying everything. Um, then we're going to have Bonnie Dixon and Michelle Dubroy, who, who are from Griffith University. And our last presenter is going to be Leanne Stockwell. So that's the order of play for this evening. Um, and I am going at this point to, um, and there'll be question time at the end of that. Um, so um, face shield off and make a space fast response. Steph Piper from USQ. Steph, if you would like to share your screen, I will stop sharing and hand over to you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you guys all see my screen all right? Uh, maybe not. Yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing a, uh, presenter view at the moment, I think. Yes, we are okay. presenter view. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's give that another crack. Cool. Uh, okay, let me switch my screen. Technology down. is fun. Classic. Okay, here we go. This is the time. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay, that's a bit better. How's that? That's much better. Well done. That's better. Good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Steph Piper. I'm from the University of Southern Queensland, which is located up in Toowoomba, uh, about an hour and a half away from Brisbane. And I'll be talking to you today about um, a face shields project that I did uh, earlier on this year to tackle some of the PPE shortage problem that we face locally. Uh, so let's go. Let's let's get into it. So. Uh, a bit of background anyway. So uh, my role is I'm the community engagement coordinator and I essentially run the library makerspace. So this is a little snapshot of our makerspace here. You can see that we've got a few 3D printers. We've got a 3D scanner, a um, bit of electronics bench type stuff. Um, that's the kind of kit we've got at the moment. And so background on me as well. Um, so I'm a bit of a, an expert in 3D printing for medical stuff. So I used to uh, work at QT looking at 3D printable biodegradable scaffolds for implantation for a little while. And since then, I've done some pretty exciting projects with the Toowoomba based hospital, making 3D printable casts for broken bones, which is now an open source project. And I've also been working pretty closely with uh, Toowoomba hand therapy to make uh, prosthetic figures as well. Um, so I'm pretty keen on my 3D printing, uh, as you can see. Um, but anyway, so at the start of this year, as you all know, there was a huge PPE shortage that swept around the world. It wasn't a problem that just Australia faced, it was everywhere. And so with COVID uh, coming along, um, quite a few makers around the world began to step up and meet the challenge by 3D printing and laser cutting full face shield protective devices like this one here that you can see. So this is probably the most mainstream one that was created uh, by Prusa. And as you can see, it's a full face protection, which is important because if you have a, like a, um, a shortage of masks or goggles or anything like that, this solves that problem. And the idea behind it is if you can look up on my camera view here, I've got a uh, one here, that if someone starts to sneeze or cough on you with like this spray bottle here, you know, you've got a full face protection. Nothing's getting in, you know, you're sorted. So yeah, it's super important that we protect our healthcare services. And so I knew that I needed to keep an eye on this project anyway. I needed to make sure that um, we were looked after because out in Toowoomba, we're in the regional area. And if there were, you know, going to be priority areas uh, for dropping off extra PPE, we weren't going to be potentially as high on that list. And we're a gateway town for some of the other huge sort of, 
you know, Western regional towns like Dalby, Warwick, all those kinds of places where if an outbreak happens there, um, you've got to make sure that, you know, Toowoomba's ready to tackle with a potential extra load of people who have overwhelmed those small practices out there. So we're the spot that everyone's going to be looking to, um, you know, as closest, um, you know, sort of not counting Brisbane anyway. Um, so uh, down in Brisbane anyway, they stepped up to meet the mark pretty quickly. Uh, the team at Metro North put a call out and they got 3,000 donated shields in a week, which is pretty fantastic to cover the, the North Side hospitals. And similarly um, for Metro South, 3D1, a, a big 3D printing company stepped in and I think they've made around 10,000 face shields to date um, for the hospitals in the lower Brisbane area. And so around this time, I was keeping a pretty close eye on how things were, were brewing. And um, I ended up getting a call from Darling Downs Health to ask whether we could do something um, in our local area. And the same day, I got a call from my laser cutter friend who said, hey, I've got enough material here to make 700 face shields. Are we doing this? And so, um, yeah, looking around, I realized that I was probably one of the few people that was distinctly qualified to lead something like this for our local area. And so I was sort of put in a corner where I was like, oh no, <laughs> I've got to do this. Um, Cause I know about 3D printing. I have all the local community connections in the healthcare service. Um, it seems to be um, not a project that I uh, actively stepped up plate to, but realized that I was, you know, one of the last people um, who could actually pull it off. And so uh, we got stuck into it. What I did, was I pulled together a group of local uh, businesses and organizations. So while um, I work at USQ, it was a, a collaboration of local businesses and organizations and stakeholders essentially. And so we got a group together called DDPPE, Darling Downs PPE. And so uh, with this group, um, we ended up starting to tackle the problem. And to be completely honest, this project was probably one of the most stressful projects that I have ever undertaken. And so, um, honestly, like there was such a huge disconnect between the priority that I felt for this project and the bureaucracy that usually comes with normal decision making, as you can imagine. And so, for example, one of the GPs that was in our group working with us, he said to me, he's like, Steph, I've got my doctors going down to Bunnings on the weekend buying gloves. I've got you know, them cutting up garbage bags on the weekend because we don't have enough gowns. Like we need to get this stuff sorted. And meanwhile, we've just put up this website and um, one of the uh, public health network places gave us a call and said, excuse me, can you please take down the words PPE shortage? Because we don't want people to start stressing out. Um, and yeah, so like once we finally got a design approved by our local hospitals, the hospital's weren't like able to purchase them. So the businesses involved in making them ended up having to, you know, like, like they had a cost price of five bucks on them, you know, just to cover materials. They ended up having to give them away as a donation to those local healthcare services because their financial red tape wouldn't let them purchase things that weren't strictly approved, um, even though they desperately needed the gear. And, you know, once we said, oh, we'll, we'll just give them to you if you need them, they said, oh yeah, We'll take a hundred straight away, pretty please, please, <laughs> um, which is pretty wild. Um, we also had a lot of people who were keen on 3D printing uh, for us, but then backed out due to legal concerns around whether they were going to get in trouble for 3D printing, you know, something that wasn't quite up to scratch. Um, we had, like, I had to call around to a, quite a few hospitals and healthcare places to explain the project. And there was a very distinct lack of understanding between what the difference between a face mask and a face shield was. And um, they didn't realize how important um, the face shields were in comparison and what the difference was. So there was a, a lack of education that early on as well. And to be honest, there was a whole lot of skill lack of recognition as well. So there's a lot of people who sort of gave me a bit of an edge of, you know, what are you doing running this? You know, who are you? What are you up to? what's, what's this all about? You know? So yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. Um, so, um, but to finish off the project ended up making 370 face shields for our local area, plus 150 touch free door openers, uh, for aged care hospitals. And now, uh, we're finally in a position where our mass manufacturers have caught up. What a glorious sight. So this is one of the big injection molders down in Brisbane. They've got their face shields for sale and oh, just last weekend, look at this Bunnings 
come through three bucks of face shield. How good is that? So it's a very good feeling. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening to my presentation. Cool. Thank you very much for that. Um, so participants, please, if you do have questions, I, I encourage you to add those to the, the chat feed um, and our uh, RLA Queensland team will uh, collate those so that when we get to the question and answer time, um, that will be um, covered then and our presenters will have an opportunity um, to get in there and answer those questions for you. So, um, that was Steph. Our next presenters are Sue Hartley and Daniel Walker from Bond University. Um, they are going to be gamifying our time for us. Um, and as I hand over to them, I will take the opportunity to promote the, um, the hashtag Alia Queensland Survivor. Um, so that's if any of you are using social media feeds, um, let's feed that one into it and I'll stop sharing and hand over to Sue and Daniel. Good afternoon, everyone. And we hope that you have your devices at the ready. So welcome to Library Survivor, the live game. We're not reporting back today on anything. We are creating a new experience based on your 2020 lived experiences. My name's Sue Hutley. Um, I'm at Bond University Library and so is the amazing Daniel Walker, one of our librarians here, who is our digital dexterity champion and gamify expert. So we'd like to welcome you. I'd also like to, on behalf of us all, acknowledge the traditional owners. We come from the Gold Coast and so the Kumba Mary clan of the Yukon Bear people, um, but we acknowledge all of the traditional lands that we come from today. So we're going to get into the live game. I'm going to do just two tips. Please make sure if you can to have a device with you, an iPad or something else. We are going to put uh, links into the chat. So please make sure that you have the chat open. Uh, and I just want to say go Team Orange. And I'm now going to hand over to Dan. Thank you. Um, hopefully you guys can all see my game screen. Um, so just to start off with, this could all go horribly wrong, but it's 2020, it might happen. Um, even if it does, it's all a bit of fun, so let's not stress too much about it. But we're going to attempt to do a bit of a live game. Um, you've got two ways of doing it. So Sue's going to put in a link to our library guide. You can, um, if you've got two screens or a second device, you can do it through there and follow along, and I'll tell you um, what to do. Otherwise, you can just watch the screen, and Sue will put in all the challenges we have. She'll put in the link in the chat, and you can do it through there as well. Um, just very quickly, this was built just using libguides, poll everywhere, images from Unsplash, and a little bonus we'll see at the end as well. Um, so welcome to Library Survivor, the live game. Um, the premise here is your library has closed its physical doors due to COVID-19. Physical customers can no longer come inside your library and all staff members must now work from home. Far-fetched, I know. Um, only instead of going home, you're being whisked away to an island where you must overcome challenges to continue to meet your library customer needs. Okay, so we've got two tribes for you guys to pick from. Um, if you have had a look in this guide before when the link was sent around, um, I think yesterday, you might have already picked a tribe. Otherwise, just pick a colour you like. But we've got our Baylinda Blue tribe who live on the beach and we've got our Oranga Book Tank tribe, um, the Orange tribe who live deep in the jungle. And so what I want you guys to do now is either the link that, oh, and we're already starting to do it, um, putting which tribe you're going to join. So we've got our blue tribe and your orange tribe and just make your selections now just to see how we're all traveling. I'll give you guys about another 10 seconds to pick your tribe. It looks pretty even at the moment, which is cool. Come on, more orange, more orange. I'm impartial, so. <laughs> you want, but I think Sue's going for Team Orange, as you can see by her clothes. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, that's actually really good. We've got 50-50. So they're very even tribes. So we have our tribes now. Okay. And in true Survivor style, anyone who actually watches the show, um, they often quite... Oh, there we go. They quite often give tribe names and then just never speak of them again. So for the rest of the, um, the game, it's just going to be Orange Tribe, Blue Tribe. So we have our two tribes. Now, just remember which one you've picked. If you forget, again, it doesn't really matter, um, but just to add to a bit of the fun. So 
if you're playing along with the guide, now hit the button to go to the next page. Dan, we've had a bit of uh, lag on the computer time, so we're just going to let people have just one second to catch up. Cool. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so we've got our two tribes now. Um, the next thing we're going to do is fill out your tribes a little bit more. So there's each tribe. I'm going to give you a list of 12 members each, and we want you to pick five of them. So if you're in the blue tribe, make your selections from the blue link on the guide or in the chat. If you're on the orange tribe, make your selection. So we can see the different names here. We've got 12 on each one, and we're going to see who can build the best tribe. So think about, you know, we're working from home. What are the best um, tribe members? They all have different skills that would, um, you know, help us in different situations. So have a look at your tribe members and let's go and pick the remaining five tribe mates. And so for everyone here, some of these tribe members might uh, be very familiar for when you were working from home or if you're still working from home. So we hope that you really associate with these tribe member descriptions. Yeah, so I'm going to see all the, I'm going to pop on the live results. So we're going to see how the two tribes get built. Here we go. We'll give you about another 20, 30 seconds for this or until the numbers look like they're settling down and then we'll see what the tribes look like. There's some lived experience coming in here. I see everyone values that internet connection. <laughs> well, let's hope it holds out tonight. <laughs> I was thinking that online food delivery could be quite popular. Or well, Netflix. Yeah, why is Netflix not getting up there? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to give you guys 10 more seconds and then we'll have a look at the tribes, how they've matched up. So making your final selections if you haven't yet. Okay, let's have a look at the tribes. So Blue Tribe have picked Column Collaboration, Sven Strong Internet Connection, Mike Mental Wellbeing, Adam Adaptability and Pete Physical Wellbeing. And the Orange Tribe has Sue, oh, I think one just changed it, um, Sue Strong Internet Connection, Dan Digital Dexterity, Alinta Adaptability, Craig, creativity and clear collaboration. So we've got two different tribes here. So that's really cool. So oh, I can see they're still going. <laughs> cool. still so now we have our two different. tribes. We have our blue tribe and our orange tribe. Perfect. So now we're going to work on, look, just to say to this, we could have done a really big one, but in 15 minutes, we're going to compress that a little bit. Um, so we've got a challenge for you now. So if you're playing along with the guide, please hit the next page now. I'll go into storyteller mode. Okay, so after spending the night adjusting to island life and getting to know your new tribe mates and probably some bugs and that as well, a new day dawns and you've got tree mail. So it's time to compete in your first survivor challenge. Um, both tribes arrive at the challenge arena and our challenge for today is lending to customers. So how will your tribe best overcome the challenge of providing resources to customers while our doors are closed and we're all working from home. Um, there's gonna be, again, the two links in for the blue and the orange, or you can do it on the guide if you're um, doing it through there. In this one though, you only get to make one selection each. Um, it'll still click Clayton by tribes. So what is the one you would use best to deliver services, um, your resources to your customers? Click and collect, post out material, no loans at all, or finding online versions of print resources. Okay, survivors ready? Go. I'll pop up the results. I'll give you guys about another 20 seconds to make your decisions. Looks like it's a pretty even race at the moment. Both tribes are competing strong. There we go, and we'll count yours down. Five. Four, three, two, one, challenge complete. Okay, let's see how we went. Blue Tribe has done finding online versions of print resources, um, as has Orange, so that's both pretty even, but then Blue Tribe have also done some click and collect and posting out material, and Orange Tribe has had some click and collect as well. Okay, so that was a really good challenge. Um, let's click on the next page now, if you're playing along on the guide at home. Um, it was really even. Both tribes picked the same 
online resources. So we might have to do a tiebreaker. Um, it's the same question. So it's like, how can we provide resources to customers? But in this one, we want you to share your innovative ideas for lending to customers. Now, just before we get started, um, you can be as creative, silly, serious as you want. Put in real things you've done or just let your imagination go wild. Um, you can enter as many suggestions as you want and the host, which will be me, will pick who's the winner. Um, just a tip though too. So this is gonna do a word, word cloud for each tribe, but if you're doing more than one word, put a dash in between, because if you do spaces, it splits them up into separate words. And I'll pop up on the screen um, the two word clouds. If you can start typing in now, if you see one for your tribe that you like, type it in again, we'll make it go bigger. Okay, so let's do our final challenge. We'll give you guys about a minute if we've got time to do this, just so we can get some really good answers coming in. Looks like Blue Tribe's jumping on the drone straight away. Orange Tribe's go on the Uber route. Um, let me know if you can't see those results on the screen, so hopefully it's all displaying up. <laughs> Okay, keep putting your answers in. We'll go for about another 20 seconds. Maybe you can put in as many as you want. And if you see one on your tribe you like, just keep typing it in again. You can make it really big. Okay. And we'll count you down, put in your final answers. Go five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see how the tribes have gone. And no doubt these word clouds are still going to move around a little bit. But let's see what we've got here. And I might just pop back to the guide. No, that little thing's a bit annoying. Um, so I will just pop onto this one and now just have a look. So the blue tribe have gone with, oh, keeps moving. Um, a lot of drones, roll it down a hill, virtual collection, catapults, some Uber, robots. Portable hotspots, holograms, I like that. <laughs> okay, so some good answers there. Roll it down a hill, nice. Good for your customers that live in low-lying lands. Okay, let's see how the orange tribe went. And we've got some drones, Uber, airdrop, <laughs> book frisbee, that's a cool one. <laughs> Street funding, walking tour, back of a truck, we've got a dog jumping in, cool. Buy everyone their own coffee. <laughs> Good if you can afford that one. <laughs> Airdrop's cool. So we've got some really great results. So um, we can send you guys images of these later to these word clouds if you would like. No, Look, as, as, as the impartial arbiter, I'm just going to say that, that Orange did it. That they said coffee. Oh, really? I can't see that on my screen yet. There's coffee. That was it. Who has to put more coffee into Orange to make it <laughs> Um, See, so, and it depends too, because sometimes if we're looking on these screens, it could be a little bit different than on the other screen. Um, but yeah, it looks like it was pretty close. Um, so who's going to win? So that's the end of the challenges. And now we're going to see who's the winner of Library Survivor. So if you're playing along, click to find who wins and let's have a look. Okay, this is super, super cheesy, but everyone wins. <laughs> So everyone's been just doing such an amazing job um, at the moment. Like you've been surviving, you've also been thriving, been going through some really hard times, but managing to keep up our services the best we can and our smiles and our attitudes with our customers. So every single person here is a library survivor. And our fabulous librarian, Sarah Beta, has made a badge for you guys. Um, I think Sue's just put in the link there, or if you're on the guide, we've got it right here. Um, with the Survivor logo so that you can download that and keep as your own little Survivor Australian Librarian um, badge of completion, basically. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for, I don't think it, I think it's sort of worked okay, but thank you for bearing with and playing Library Survivor, the live game with us. Thank you. Stop sharing my screen. That was extremely entertaining. Well done, guys. 
Okay, Let, let's go back to our, um, our slideshow and see where we are at with the order of proceedings. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so uh, once again, hashtag Alia Queensland Survivor. Thank you, Daniel and Sue. Um, our next presenters are going to be Bonnie and Michelle, uh, Bonnie Dixon and Michelle Dubroy from Griffith University. Play it their way. I'm going to let them explain what that means. Thank you. Um, I think Michelle's just going to share her screen with our presentation. Excellent. Uh, so I am uh, Bonnie Dixon and with me we also have Hello, uh, Michelle Dubroy. So I work with Bonnie in the Academic Engagement Services team. And so um, among the many things we do, we deliver library training to students and um, higher degree research candidates. We do. So we're both based at the Gold Coast campus of Griffith and we both primarily work in the health faculties as well. Okay, so. Oops, sorry. Okay, so uh, HDR Skills Week. So uh, each year the um, Griffith Graduate Research School run a week-long series of face-to-face uh, -face workshops and uh, seminars um, and the library is an active partner with the um, graduate school on that during that week and the key aim of HDR Skills Week is to get the candidates to learn those skills that they're going to need to successfully finish their degrees but also um, you know, have skills that they're going to uh, be able to use when they move into the workplace. So what we had envisioned when we talked about it in sort of the middle of January was it was going to be face-to-face uh, -face, uh, training in probably either a computer room or a seminar room and everyone was going to be gathered around together, sitting so close together. It's funny <laughs> even seeing this picture now, thinking how closely those people are sitting together. Too close. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was what we had in mind when we first uh, talked about it. Then of course, uh, the campuses uh, were shut down. We were told to pack up all of our things and drive home and not come back. So we had to quickly think about how are we going to deliver this workshop, um, the title of which was Advanced Search Skills for Literature and Systematic Reviews. Okay, so um, we hadn't actually planned much of the content other than having it in our minds. So that was a, a good, opportunity to think differently because we didn't sort of have anything already in our in our minds specific. So that was an opportunity. And we were generally fairly familiar, familiar with many of the online tools available. So we weren't too concerned about that. But the big question in our minds was, was anyone actually going to be interested in this topic? Because we'd not actually run this topic before. And especially we had no idea whether people would be interested in joining with us online. No idea. Uh, so what this meant is that instead of our group of people in a room together, what we actually ended up with instead was everyone in their own homes, just like we all are now, doing their own thing in their own spaces. And we used uh, Microsoft Teams, which is the environment that Griffith uses, um, the Microsoft environment. Uh, to help us facilitate that. Uh, and we did it in a way that let them um, engage with it in their own way. So Microsoft Teams, for those of you who don't have it at your workplaces, uh, is not just a video um, chat, video me meeting space, but also is a general communication tool. So there's channels, you sign up to Teams, there's chat spaces, you can share files. Uh, it has lots of other applications you can embed within it, so it's got quite a lot in it, um, which was really useful for us because we could set up a team, so that's our team in, uh, in my team environment, um, for the Advanced Search Skills um, Literature Review Workshop. 
And so it meant that in this team, we could then start to provide content to students. So we could treat it kind of like it was a learning management system. Uh, so we split the workshop up. So instead of delivering everything in one go, we decided to split it into daily modules around topics. So that meant that each of the topics had their own channel. They had their own space for conversations. Uh, and it really helped us to make sure that we were playing their way. So we're really engaged, trying to engage with the content in the way that our participants wanted it, which particularly was flexibly. So each day we released new modules into the team site. Uh, modules were shared as a word document or actually an online word document, uh, but they included videos and activities and links out to resources and lots of other information as well. That's a little screenshot of one of them there. And each of the modules encourage the different participants to engage with, with us in the chat. So we monitored the, the chat all, every day throughout HDR Skills Week and we got people to share their reflections of the activities. So particularly how are they going to use the skills we were discussing in their own literature reviews? How would they apply them? What have they found as work before? That kind of engagement was what we were looking for particularly. The other thing we did, which also meant we could do this in teams, is we invited participants to a live online session as well. So as well as getting the asynchronous learning, they were getting a chance to come and actually talk to us, engage with us in person, and engage with each other, which is a big part of what HDR Skills Week um, ideally was about, is also getting to meet other HDRs. Um, so this gave us a way to try and achieve some of that as well. So we had a live workshop on the Friday. Okay, so um, expectations versus reality. So we had quite a, a lot of ideas in our mind of what this was going to be, and we just kind of had to jump in and see what was going to happen once the week started. So, you know, originally we were thinking, you know, maybe 20 or so students would actually be really good because that's how many people fit inside of <laughs> one of our computer labs. And, uh, you know, you can't fit any more than what fits inside of a room. Um, in the reality, uh, in the online space, we had almost 90 users, individual users come in and do something in the team site throughout the week. Uh, we had imagined one learning path where, uh, you know, we would go up, we would deliver some content and everyone would do the activity. We would deliver some more content. Everyone would then jump in and everyone would be doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. What we had instead was that students were able to choose their own path. They could skip ahead. They could uh, spend more time in an activity if, if that interested them. And also they could do it at any time they wanted. So we had people going in there at seven o'clock in the morning, other people in at 11 o'clock at night. So people were really doing it their way. Um, and this was just something that we, you know, we we're both in the health area and we had just sort of in our minds had thought we would get a lot of health people. But actually what we found is that we had people from across all the different disciplines that we have at Griffith. So business, arts, music, all different uh, disciplines were involved. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so this idea about how the learning was going to be, we had really thought it would be a lot of listening. So us being at the top, uh, at the front talking, them talking to each other and um, very live and in person. But the reality was that the students actually, we actually asked them to do a lot of reading and writing. So reading um, resources online, reading the comments of other people, typing their comments. So there wasn't a lot of audio um, learning happening. Um, and then of course we had imagined we'd be in that computer room with everyone and we could see them. We could see their body language. We could see if they were doing the activity or were they scratching their heads or were they not on the right screen? The reality was we really had no idea what they were doing other than we could see that people were clicking on those documents. Were they reading the documents? Were they doing the activities? Were they doing it the right way or the way that we wanted them to do it? We didn't know. We had really no idea. Um, so that was um, kind of what happened. But anyways, when we got the feedback back from the tribe, the tribe has spoken, uh, the feedback was generally positive. So we were quite happy with that. Um, <clears throat> people enjoyed the chat feature. People enjoyed working on the modules each day and they enjoyed getting um, feedback. Uh, so one of the major challenges that Michelle's already touched on was the asynchronous learning is different. It's a mode of running a workshop that we'd never tried before. Um, 
and the asynchronous element of it meant that it was extremely convenient for students. They could balance their um, the demands on their time much more easily, um, which I think was particularly different for our HDR group. It's something our undergrads are much more used to doing in traditional courses, but hasn't been how content has been delivered for our PhD students in the past. It also meant the engagement was challenging. So in though, even though we had people on the chat with us every day, we were having discussions, um, it's just not the same as actually seeing people in a live class. It's not the same as seeing them in a video, even on a meeting online. Um, and it was uh, different. It was challenging, definitely, um, even though it was really positively received as well. Uh, so what would we do in the future for this? What, what would we change? What would we implement differently? Um, the first thing is that we need to build in more opportunities to check on the students and see how they're going. So we were thinking we probably want to build in more active activities. So rather than relying on discussion, um, which is definitely the mode I would use more often in a workshop with this kind of a group, um, let's build in some more actual activities that I would tend to use for undergrads instead and get that engagement happening. And then the other big thing is that we want to explore other online tools um, and options for teaching activities. Um, because we prepped this kind of on the fly, uh, we kind of tested a couple of different things. We tested using OneNote, which is baked into um, Microsoft Teams to see if that would work, decided it was going to be way too complicated to get everything functioning uh, and just went with the standard Word doc. But it gives us a lot of opportunity to explore other tools and other options in the future as well. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. That was our experience of creating a workshop, playing the student's way and delivering it in an online mode for HDR Skills Week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. That was, um, I, I think many of us have had to get outside of our comfort zone and explore the, the use of, of virtual delivery. Um, I, I know um, I, I'm employed within uh, TAFE Queensland and uh, uh, one of the um, one, one of the bylines there was that um, we, we, as librarians, been pushing electronic resources. Like, did you know we've got these e-books? You know, and and when you're dealing with guys that teach people how to, you know, cut things in half and 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 weld them back up again, they're like, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, maybe one day. Um, and, you know, they were pushed into an online or a mixed mode delivery where the, the, the classroom content was physical, you know, assessment based only, everything else had to be delivered online. Um, and I forget exactly where, the, where, where it was said, but the, uh, the line was um, never waste a good catastrophe. Um, and the uptake of ebooks has been spectacular over this COVID period. And it was really cool just watching um, how you guys use Teams. Um, I know that I need to get my head around Teams for moving into that tech space um, and uh, well, well worth sharing. Thank you. If anyone has questions around that, please add them to the chat feed. We will be getting to those. Um, so moving right along, and by the way, we are well and truly on time, which is great. Thank you, uh, Bonnie and Michelle. Our next presenters are going to be Leanne Stockwell from Griffith University. Leanne has got the rather catchy title of How's That for Timing? The Introduction, introduction of Teams Online Consultations at Griffith Library. So very much a continuation or, or, a, or a different experience, perhaps, of what we've just seen. Um, and a reminder, once again, the uh, Alia Queensland Survivor hashtag, if you are a social media user. I'll hand the screen over to Leanne. Well, thank you very much. Uh, before we um, launch into online consultations and platforms and testings and troubleshooting and support materials, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context. Um, my name is Leanne. I'm a librarian from the health team within Academic Engagement Services at Griffith Library. I work um, with Bonnie, uh, she's a team lead, and also with Michelle, who's our um, liaison with the research services team. Uh, I'll just can everyone see my screen? I'm a little bit paranoid about that. Um, it's all good, Leanne. Good, oh, great. 
um, so um, academic engagement services or AES as the name implies is the engagement arm of Griffith Library. We engage academic staff at a group and school level to provide support for digital academic and information literacies um, as well as research support services. Um, to achieve this, AES is made up of librarians like myself, um, learning advisors, digital capability advisors, as well as research specialists. So Griffith University began offering online consultations in 2014. It was a supplement to our face-to-face -face offerings. Um, Griffith has five physical campuses as well as our digital campus. Um, with online and mixed mode courses. This is all prior to COVID, obviously. Um, and certainly from a staffing perspective, um, online consultations made a lot of sense. Um, we could offer an online consult to a student if there was no staff available at that student's home campus, especially during um, peak demand. Um, there was no set platform for online consults. Um, when I did a survey, the most commonly used was WebEx, WebEx um, which could be very problematic, um, followed by Skype. Others were using Google Hangouts, um, later was Zoom, and then also some were still was using Microsoft Teams when that was um, introduced. Um, needless to say, this made for a very inconsistent client experience, and it was difficult, particularly speaking as a new staff member, um, to judge what was best practice, client communication, troubleshooting. You just sort of had to nudge the person sitting next to you on the pod and ask them what they were doing. Um, and that was how this um, project kind of came about. Um, I began as a comment in AES in early 2019. I happened to mention in my performance review that I was about to commence offering online consultations and my manager wanted to know why more students weren't taking up online consultations. Um, there had been a significant decline in the number of online consultations, total number of online consultations um, from AES in 2018. So what were the barriers? And wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for me to investigate and then write up a report about it? Um, so um, it became very clear that AES needed to offer consults on a preferred secure platform um, with a potential backup platform there in the background for a consistent client experience. Um, myself and another librarian, um, Sarah Klovac from the sciences team, and we were tasked, tasked with bringing that about. Um, regardless of COVID, which um, no one really saw coming, except perhaps maybe Bill Gates, I don't know. Um, there was a, a pressing need for the library to offer streamlined online services um, that complemented the strategic direction of Griffith University. So why Teams? Um, well, it wasn't always clear cut. Um, there were initially some technical challenges to overcome. Um, Microsoft has been adding functionality to um, Teams. It's an ongoing, it's constantly changing. Um, Zoom was a very popular option within AES. Um, and uh, Teams, however, Teams is a supported collaboration tool at Griffith University, uh, and it's provided a complete um, online um, meeting solution. I mentioned Zoom, it was a very, I mean, we're using it at the moment. It's a very popular choice among AES staff, and it was it, for a good reason. It's a very user-friendly platform. It's simple and, and easy to use. Um, there were um, security concerns by the network security team, um, and this was also some um, media uh, discussion about that at the time. And it would have been a, a hard sell anyway, as we needed to have had a corporate account, which would have been hard to justify when we already had teams being used by both staff and students as part of the Office uh, 365 platforms. And as I mentioned, teams was being heavily promoted to students as a supported collaboration tool with um, some courses were being run exclusively in teams. Um, and Blackboard was being used only as a, um, a backup, as a, as a sort of supplement. Um, and staff were already using Teams for online consultations. So bringing everybody on board, um, challenges, there were privacy concerns. Um, when you set up a consultation in Teams, you use your calendar and you, they are able to see your email address. Um, some staff were a little bit unsure of that. Previously, um, that was all managed uh, via LibCal. Um, there were uh, unclear instructions. Someone had put together instructions on using Microsoft Teams um, when Teams was very much in its infancy and they weren't clear. Um, I did try to follow those initially um, when I was first starting to um, offer online consults to students, students and it was didn't work very well at all. Um, there were technical issues with the online version of Teams. If the student didn't have the desktop app, 
and they just clicked on the link and opened up the online version of Teams. Uh, it wasn't very functional. Um, there were some group dynamics as well. Um, AES is, is got very experienced um, staff members and everyone was, as I mentioned, was everyone pretty much used to doing their own thing. So bringing everybody on board, um, we knew was gonna be a bit of a challenge, getting them to, everyone to use um, the platform. Uh, how robust was the platform? We didn't know. And how clear with our student facing instructions? Um, you might think you're being very clear. You might think you're being, um, your instructions are wonderful and why, why can't everybody follow them? Uh, the only way to get around that is to actually test them. Um, so bringing everyone on board, um, the first strategy was to just test and test and test. Um, in the library, um, in, the, in the campus libraries, we have student rovers who come in and support students um, after the main service test is closed down. They usually operate from seven anywhere up till midnight, depending on if the library's open, what time the library's open during the teaching semester. And we um, wrote them in, uh, just told them they were being asked to test an online consult. They'll be given instructions. Um, some tested on, on mobile phones, some just tested on their own laptops. We asked them to use, some used um, uh, Android, some used Apple. Um, so we were trying to get as many um, possibilities and, and make sure that it was really robust and easy for them to use. We also roped in family members. Um, Sonata had um, a couple of friends of her daughter come in um, and uh, they were good for students and we basically tested it on them as well. So we tested it both on students um, and also students who were not associated with the library and um, also on um, people who were external to Grimpeth as well. Um, one of the key things was to make ourselves available to colleagues. So if people were having trouble using the platform or they weren't sure of the instructions, um, let it know that you're, you're open to, um, to talking to people, um, you're not going to be um, belligerent or um, you're open to discussion. Um, be prepared to take any criticism on board and not take it personally. And personally, um, speaking as someone who was a former nurse, end users can never have too much training and they can never be, should never be afraid to put their hand up and say, I don't know how to do something. Um, coming from a healthcare environment where um, often you were afraid to admit you didn't know something, um, I think you need to create an environment where people are very comfortable with putting their hand up and asking a question. And, and believe in your project, believe in what you're doing, believe in um, you're trying to achieve the best possible outcome for your colleagues and also for our clients. Um, training and support materials. We produced um, videos um, in Camtasia. They were loaded into a Microsoft um, stream channel and this was embedded into the AES uh, SharePoint site. Um, the advantage of this is they can be updated as Microsoft made changes to Teams and this happens a lot. And in some ways, the, the videos are great. Um, they're very easy to follow, um, but they are also, they require a lot of upkeep and I need to do some updates to them. Um, I just haven't had a chance because Microsoft seems to love changing their interface quite regularly. Um, so we had a combination of videos, written procedures, a troubleshooting guide and an email template. And hopefully you can see what we did. Let's just bring this up. Okay, so that's, can everyone see, should say have AES in the top left hand corner? That's yep, we're right. seeing that. Great, okay, that's good. So we've got um, obviously our written procedures. We have an email template that we can send off to students. I'll just open that up so you can take a look at that. Um, we've got a troubleshooting trips, tips and tricks. The common one that comes up is um, same thing that happens with um, uh, Zoom and sometimes with Skype as well as um, the audio settings can, can change with no reason. So we just had our template, we had some standard procedures as well, and then we had our actual um, consults, which I can just show you a little bit of what the video looks like. So the nice thing about using streams, it will also um, uh, do some auto captioning as well. Oops, probably don't need to hear my voice talking. But um, that was just to make sure that um, we got everyone on board um, and uh, the uh, procedures were nice and easy to follow. Uh, nearly one year later, uh, feedback and reflections. Um, the feedback on Teams has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I did do a survey of my colleagues and um, Teams got a rating of excellent to good um, with over, I think it was, we got about an 80% 80, 80 excellent rating on Teams. Um, it's certainly, the timing was extremely fortunate going into COVID. 
Uh, most people use Teams exclusively. Some do use Zoom or Skype as a backup, um, but um, most, most are using Teams pretty much exclusively. Our feedback um, evolving the materials was, was very positive. Um, one thing I will say is that um, get the support materials right from the start. Um, we had a little hiccup with one of the main ones, which was on scheduling a consult. Um, it wasn't as clear as it needed to be. And unfortunately, I think we lost a couple of people with that one and they never, the transition wasn't very smooth for them. Um, so some of the feedback on the, trans, on the materials um, perhaps could have been better. That's something that um, I would need to take on board. That was with the videos. Um, and even though we did go back and correct and we made an announcement, it kind of, it just didn't quite sit well with a few people. Um, but um, the other um, thing we found is that um, some people really sort of um, took the, the, the procedures and the, the videos on board of, and they became like the experts within, within the team and people would kind of go to them for, for support, which was great. Um, uh, so I would say having teams in place was extremely fortunate going into COVID. It means, meant we were basically, our consults were that side of our service was taken care of um, and um, it made, we met, we were able to focus on our online teaching um, and meant we were very, very familiar with the platform that was being used, that is being used throughout Griffith University. Uh, well, thank you very much for, uh, that was uh, our experience using Teams at Griffith Library, ongoing experience. The experience so fast. Thank you so much for sharing, Leanne. That was actually quite informative. Um, so we're uh, we're moving on a pace, and we're going to have some time for questions, which is great because I believe there have been a few questions in the chat feed. Um, so uh, you know, only because being a stuck record is great. Um, hashtag Alia Queensland Survivor. If anyone is using social media, um, that's your hashtag. Um, so. Um, the presenters will be receiving gifts I have built into my slides. Um, so I th we will organize with our presenters for them to receive some high quality Alia merchandise, um, which may or may not be promotional material for a conference that never happened in Sydney. It, it, it may wind up being a collector's item in time to come, you never know. Um, so question time. I am going to stop presenting so that we can see the lovely faces of all of our presenters and mute myself because I'm going to hand over to Fiona Miles who has been collating our questions and uh, let's see what our most popular questions were. Um, actually, we haven't got any yet. So I've put it in the chat. To Everyone ask no, questions we... now. <laughs> now, ask your question. Um, yes, no one's put any questions out yet. Just speaking and to um, to Leanne's presentation, um, you were saying that Zoom was very popular and, mm. and you know, we're, we're in Zoom now. It's a great platform. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, ca I can tell you that we came across an experience with there's some crossover between TAFE and um, delivery into um, Ed Queensland schools. And apparently Zoom is on the list of forbidden programs within that environment. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that can be an issue. Yeah, um, it, it the, sort of the, the, the great firewalls that, that protect places sometimes get in the way of our delivery systems. I don't know if yeah, you have any got, experience of that. It, um, it wasn't recommended by the, net, the Griffith um, security team, network security team. Um, we were told that it was, was not, um, even though, and Learning Futures, which is um, sort of our teaching support um, unit um, were actively promoting teams as well. So yeah, we were aware there were some security concerns, which was one of the reasons why we went with teams um, as part of the decision. Mm. Okay, I've actually got a couple of questions popping up now. And first one was from our panelist, Daniel. Um, he was asking whether, whether, sorry, just scrolling back to it, uh, asking if requests were still coming in for face masks. Uh, to Steph. Hey. Uh, we did actually get uh, one last trickle through request come through a few weeks ago and um, from that we've closed the project off but yeah it definitely shows that we can just you know off our own backs we can just make stuff you know we don't need to rely on uh, you know some kind of manufacturing center we can just in our own communities get this stuff done. Uh, that, that's 
Very cool, Steph. Having done that and gone through the, the, the learning curve of pulling resources and, and talents together to make it happen, if, you know, COVID got off the hook again in a month's time, do you feel like you would be able to kickstart this again more quickly or do you think it would still be a, a learning curve all over again? Oh, for sure. No, we'd definitely be ready and we'd be faster this time around. We'd be on the ball. We know all the stuff backwards and forwards. You want to ask Listen me about the, me. you know, the therapeutic goods administration legalization? I got the answers. I know about yes. it. <laughs> I'm ready. Yes. Yeah. And, and then there was a, sorry. So I was just going to say libraries being a, a space that, that have a lot of interaction with the, the sort of maker, maker movement as well. Um, you know, if, if we do, you know, wind up with a, a, another serious spike in the whole COVIDness or, or some other catastrophe overtakes us, um, do you feel like you would have an advice set that would be of value to others if we had, you know, the, um, you know, the, the Winton Shire Library wanting to start a makerspace and produce masks? Do you feel like you'd be well positioned to give advice? Would you be prepared to do that? Um, and, and what advice do you have for others in that mix? For sure. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely something that was packaged up quite well to, for local communities to make their own responses to if needed. Um, I ended up writing an article for Diode Magazine, which is a hobbyist electronics magazine in Australia, on the face shields movement for people to get involved. Um, so, yeah, I'd be very happy to you know, step in and mentor, um, hopefully, should the need not arise. Mm. Um, yeah. I saw nice. there's also a question, um, what's next for your PPR group? Uh, obviously, uh, full hazmat suits uh, are on the list as well for when things get truly dire uh when the zombie outbreak occurs um yeah we'll be making those as well <laughs> not really great i also had a i think it's a question from bonnie to dan and sue are you using the libguide game style uh, for other purposes teaching online resources um not as such um i was just trying to find a way of how could i make a 15 minute game that kind of works and stuff because we're going to think about breakout groups like no can't do that in 15 minutes um we do use loop guides quite a bit um I, we're doing a game this week actually with our new law student students that we do called law live requests and we're doing that through microsoft um forms um so we usually just pick whatever platform works best for the situation so yeah lib guides form sometimes just do like these wheel spinnings and that um but it worked pretty well. I just used Poll Everywhere, embedded it um, directly into the guide, got all the images from Unsplash. Um, I've got a little credits thing on the end of the page too. Um, but yeah. Right. And awesome. I definitely mastered the, the short form of gamification. I, I think there's a, a lot of potential for that to be applied to all sorts of different contexts. Mm, definitely. That is that engagement with everybody. Um, participating which makes it fun. Um, there was another question about contacting uh, you Daniel. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that we'd be able to provide some type of contact detail for any of our panelists if that's possible. Yeah. For later purposes maybe? Yeah and probably just my work email would be the easiest way but um... we, we can send that out to the participants at a later stage if you like. Yeah, I'll um, insert that that's your, yeah. your profile yeah. into chat too. Oh, sorry. Okay. It's in there twice now. <laughs> okay. Um, apart from that, many, many thank yous from the people, from other people as well. Um, and, and some people are using team already. So that's a few questions. There's, there's no more at the moment unless someone pipes up from here. There was one I did see asking, uh, Narrowly oh. was asking about how we're supporting academics and uh, we've, we've explained how we support academics and postgrads, but she was asking about undergrads. Um, so I know at Griffith, um, undergrad support is quite different to that for academics and postgrads because we're embedded in their classes. Um, so we're showing up at lectures or in workshops, um, mm. all of which obviously had to very swiftly move online after week five mm. um, in T1. Oh, sorry, trimester one, semester one for probably the rest of you. Um, 
So they get much more direct support. They get online workshops baked in, they get resources delivered straight to their learning management system. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. That's how the support works for the Griffith undergrads, yeah. Great, thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, if that's it for the questions, um, I do want to absolutely thank everyone for the time that you have given to this this evening, um, both to our presenters who have been amazing and to our attendees.